Hey everyone, this is Don Rasmussen. We're here at the Quartermaster uh, Podcast and I just want to welcome you to today's session. We have a very exciting session for all of you chiropractors out there specifically, and that is I have Dr. Jim McDaniel in here. Actually, history on him is he was a past client and uh, he saw the value of the research and development tax credit and realized that once he sold his practice that he wanted to give back to the industry. So Dr. Jim, welcome uh, to our podcast today. Thanks, Don. Good to be here in North Carolina with you. Yeah. Well, and so tell everyone a little bit about, first of all, your experience, and we'll go talk about what you do currently at Quartermaster and, and so how we can help our DCs. Yeah, as Don said, um, we were clients of Quartermasters back in 2020, and we were introduced to the R&D credit. And, and I'll tell you the truth, Don. Frankly, when I first heard about research and development, what I, my initial thought was, hey, we don't really do research. You know, we're just clinicians. I, I see patients, and, uh, and, and that's kind of what I do. But then it was explained to me that research and development that we're doing is the research and development we do to build our practice to provide better patient care. Um, and that made sense to me. And it's like, yeah, you know, we do that all day, and, you know, most chiropractors I know do. So we went through the process. Uh, we got the R&D credit for our practice in 2020, and then sold my practice, and we moved from Vermont to Florida. And uh, Can't imagine why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we, so. we followed our grandkids down there. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, it was, it was a great experience. The R&D credit helped us out. Mm -hmm. um, it was coming right off of the heels of COVID and the PPP, which also was a big benefit for us, thanks to Quartermaster. Um, and, you know, we had a conversation. I was given the chance to join the team and talk to other chiropractors about my experience. And, uh, and here we are. And now, over the years, I'm now the director of the R&D department at Quartermaster. Yeah. So, you know, that's what I explain to a DCs out there all the time, Doc, is that, you know, what we're looking at is what you're doing Monday through Friday that would qualify. And like you said, most DCs don't believe that they qualify for research and development. They think, well, I'm just treating patients. And, but the reality is what they are doing Monday through Friday is generally a qualified activity when it comes to research and development. So let, let's talk about some of the examples that we would see in a typical uh, DC practice. And, and, and so because he's over the R&D department, everyone, he's actually doing the studies. And he we works with our legal team. He actually takes you through the, uh, the question and answer process. And so kind of walk through what, first of all, what DC should expect when they're coming up for their first discovery call with you? Yeah, so part of what we're looking at is the time that you do spend researching and, and what that would look like in a chiropractic practice would be, you know, you're reading journals, you're reading things online, trying to discover better ways to improve your patient care. Or a CE class at, at, a, at a conference, state conference or something like that there. Yeah, as long as it's, it's subject matter appropriate. If it's just a general billing or documentation seminar, that obviously doesn't count. Gotcha. Um, but, uh, and I'll give you a real world example. We had, a, we had a doc who was researching and looking into bringing dry needling into his practice. Okay. So he did some training, he read journal articles, he had even consulted with colleagues that he was learning from about dry needling. Mm -hmm. And particularly, he was wanting to know if dry needling would help improve his results with some of his musculotendinous patients. Um, and basically, he did his research, he brought dry needling into his practice, so at that point, he had to develop his processes mm -hmm and his procedures for dry needling. He was then testing, and did he get better results when he was doing dry needling with his patients in addition to his adjustments and other manual therapies? Mm -hmm. um, so that right there is the definition of research and development. Sure. And so just to remind everybody, there's a four-part test that the IRS requires that we meet. Number one, it's got to be technological in nature. Number two, there's got to be a level of uncertainty at the outset, and that's what that doctor was doing, is saying, listen, you know, I don't know exactly what's going to get you well uh, specifically, but we're going to try to introduce the dry needling in there in part of our uh, protocol to help the healing process happen quicker. Yep. Uh, third one is a trial and error process, and that goes into, okay, so we tried this process or protocol, 
in the treatment. And then, you know, if it, you know, we saw some moderate results and then we want to see if we can improve upon those. And that's where, you know, that's that trial and error process. And then lastly, it's gotta be based upon the hard sciences, which chiropractic specifically does. So this is the four part test that you're taking everybody through and asking those type of questions. So um, then I guess my next question is, in, in the conversations that you are going to have with the DCs who are gonna be uh, coming on board, how do they best prepare themselves to make sure they're optimizing the amount that they get back in their R&D credit? Yeah, one of, the, one of the biggest things that I see is that initially when, we, when I talk to the docs, their initial knee-jerk reaction is to underestimate how much time they're actually spending researching. And, and you know, what I've found talking to hundreds of docs over the last couple of years is that when we start asking them, you know, how much time are you spending looking through journal articles, looking online, if you have to look something up to give you more information about how this might be utilized with a patient, all of that time counts. And what I'm seeing around the country is that it usually averages between anywhere between three hours a week to 10 hours a week, depending on wow. the practitioner. Um, so the biggest thing you can do is really spend a little time thinking about how much time you do spend researching better ways to treat your patients. Okay. Um, like in my case, for instance, I did that almost every lunchtime. I was pulling up the internet and it might be a half an hour a day or 45 minutes a day. Um, but, you know, all that time adds up. Interesting. So, so let me ask you a question. So, uh, you know, we talk with a lot of DCs around the country, and some of them uh, are, so there's two different camps, I call it. We have the purists who are strictly chiropractic, just hands-on patients. Uh, and then we have those who are going to introduce modalities and other treatment protocols. So, so a, a, a DC out there who is strictly adjusting, maybe, you know, using uh, an activator or, you know, those type of activities, can they still qualify for R&D? Yeah, especially if you're looking at either a, a couple things you could look at if you have a, a strictly adjustment only practice. Um, if you are looking at different adjusting techniques, mm -hmm. for instance, if you're comparing um, activator versus a, a manual adjustment for certain patient populations, mm -hmm if there is some trial and error involved in that to find the best way to approach that patient, then that could be a qualifying activity. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that if you're looking at your treatment frequencies and treatment plans and what's appropriate for certain patient populations, that also would qualify for an R&D activity. Of, okay. Again, trying to improve your patient outcomes where there is uncertainty now, if, if, you're, if you're a practitioner that everything's all dialed in and you pretty much do what you do, then there's probably not a lot of R&D activity. Sure. But frankly, that's the minority. Yeah. Um, Unless you're the joint. Well, and even, even some of those practices, they, they have some specialization that they can, they can make some tweaks on. But, mm -hmm. but exactly, if, if it's more of a patient-directed, if you're creating care plans, if you're modifying your care plans, if you're working on improving your technique. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of docs who say, you know, I was taught this technique, but I have modified it based on my own experiences and my own trial and error. Sure. They've developed their own techniques. Um, it doesn't have to be a marketable technique. And frankly, it doesn't have to be new to the world. It's just new to you then that's a qualifying activity. Very important point. Yeah. Very interesting. Now, let me ask you a question, because I, I always summarize things like, uh, you know, when you're doing a, an exam and then a re-exam, that's helping quantify it for the IRS that there's been an improvement, and, and for you to judge if there's been an improvement. Would you agree with that? Yeah, part of the requirements mm -hmm. for R&D is that you do have to be evaluating your outcomes, um, and whatever that looks like in your practice, that could be... And, and oftentimes that'll include physical exam, that'll include um, outcome assessment forms, uh, it could be repeat x-rays, really whatever you're using as a metric. Mm -hmm. But there is a requirement that you are examining and then following up with a re-evaluation or re-exam or what some people call progress exam. Sure. Now I want to be clear um, on two things. Number one, does it have to be the doctor, the chiropractor who's doing this the, the exams and re-exams, 
Um, number two, uh, the modalities, which we'll talk about here in a second. Does it have to be the DC who's doing that? So would you kind of speak to that? Yeah, if, if, you, if you were delegating to your staff and they are doing part of the evaluation process, if that's, you know, with, with in legalities and such, then... Certain states, of course. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and if they're adequately trained and, and under the supervision and, and all the things of, of checking the legal boxes, then, then part of that staff time is involved. Um, so it doesn't have to be just done by the doc. Uh, and in fact, that's a great thing where if you're using diagnostics, uh, something like JTEC or some of the other high tech. CLA, different ones. Exactly. Yeah. Part of the time and energy that the staff is investing in those processes can count towards your R&D. So that, that's a great question. Very good. And then let's sort of talk about the, the other type or the other camp, if I call it, that utilize modalities. So decompression, laser, electric stem, all these type of things. So kind of walk them through how that process looks so as far as that those two tests, you know, the uncertainty and the trial and error. Yeah, most times when you're bringing in, in multimodal approaches, multiple modalities, you're built into that as you're trying to figure out the best approach. For instance, um, is decompression done with laser, with an adjustment? Are you going to get better results than, say, just decompression alone or... Um, you know, a decompression with an adjustment. So all of that will accentuate the R&D process. Um, oftentimes in a, a multimodal or even multidisciplinary practice, there's a lot of uh, trial and error involved to try to improve your outcomes. Sure. So, you know, practices that do offer multiple modalities or multiple providers uh, do very, very well with this because it's also those other providers who are involved in the R&D process. Yeah, so the key here is time spent. Exactly. So you, what, what you are determining when you're doing the testing, Doc, is how much time on an average week are you spending or your staff spending in these activities? And so that's what's being judged, um, you know, each and every day. Yep, exactly. And, and I'll just walk you through a little bit about what, what we look for when, we, when I am on, on talking to the docs. Um, we talk about their time spent, that, that research component that we mentioned, reading journals, doing the research on their technique or their protocol or their modality. And we also ask about the time it takes to implement uh, protocols and then improve protocols. Um, oftentimes what that'll look like is in a doctor's meeting or at a staff meeting, uh, staff will give input about their experiences. Say, for instance, if you have a staff member who's um, actually the one who's doing the laser on patients, mm -hmm. you know, there may be talk about, hey, doc, I'm noticing with these shoulder patients, um, I think we need to do more laser for a longer time or different settings. So that's kind of the protocol formation. I see. And the other time that is capturable for R&D is that time it takes to evaluate a new patient, also the time to formulate a care plan for that new patient, and then the time it takes to reevaluate that patient. So we ask the doc, how much time are you spending in these activities? Do you have any staff who are assisting you in these activities? So these are the time frames that we're able to recover for R&D. I see, interesting. So last thing I want to talk about is, you know, a, a big push in the chiropractic space has been integrated practices. And so can you speak to those who are either contemplating or who have created an integrated practice? What has that done to the R&D credits? I mean, that's, how has that in, impacted those? Yeah, some of, the, some of the biggest credits we see mm -hmm. are in integrated practices. Uh, because it does, and, and anyone who's integrated will know, there is so much time and effort to coordinate, create the protocols. So it's really, as you alluded to, this credit is, it's, it's not coupled to the cost of equipment. It's really the application and the utilization. So the more time involved and invested in developing these integrated practices, you know, the more reward you get, because really the bottom line of this credit is to reward and enhance innovation and experimentation yeah. in the business. Absolutely. 
Dr. Jim, um, one last thing that I just wanted to kind of, so what has been the challenge in your conversations with these DCs? And that is, listen, I'm, I've been a tax planner for 35 years, and the reality is everybody wants to mitigate their taxes. So they, if they're an S corporation, they have a tendency to lower their W-2, which we get that. Um, but what do you find in your conversation with these DCs, and, and how does it you know, negatively impact their R&D? Yeah, the, um, for, in, this, in the instance of an S Corp, mm -hmm. um, the, only, the only thing that we can look at for the R&D credit are the wages of the W-2 wages. Correct. So um, I've seen very big practices where the owner doc takes a very small W-2, uh, and that is a, well, for a couple reasons, and you could speak better than I on, on the implication with the IRS, but on an R&D standpoint, that's going to minimize their credit because yep. there's, just, there's, there's just not enough juice there for the credit itself. Yep, absolutely. And so to speak to that, uh, matter of fact, I was on a call this week. It's interesting we're having this conversation. So the practice is doing about four. He, pardon me. The the DC is getting about four hundred thousand dollars in income, taking sixty six thousand dollars in payroll, which depend upon what part of the country you're at, that may or may not be sufficient to meet the reasonable compensation test. And so one of the things I want to encourage you that uh, if you know, and, and this, and I asked him, how did you come to this conclusion? He said, well, I talked to my CPA, and he said, eh, you could probably take about you know sixty to seventy thousand dollars. Well, the problem is that's not defensible with the IRS or state um, uh, taxing authority as well. I know some audits out in California specifically on this, but if you like us to, we have actually a, re a service that we subscribe to that comes from the Department of Labor and the IRS that gives us factual numbers of what your reasonable compensation uh, should be. And if you're interested, you can click below and request us to send you a link it's something you'd answer very, very simply, you know, because, uh, listen, Doc, you know this, as own your own practice. Chiropractors wear a lot of different hats. Absolutely. And so, you know, when we do that R&D study, we're, I'm probably a reasonable compensation study, we're trying to determine how much time you're spending in administration, you know, doing your, your notes every day that you have to, you have to do, uh, off, uh, overseeing your staff, you know, taking care of payroll or all the things that, running a business, you know, depending upon if you're doing it or some of your staff, you're not always having hands-on patients. As a matter of fact, for most chiropractors, they're fortunate if they can have 50% of their time with hands-on patients. Would you agree with that? Yep, exactly. So. A lot of hoops you have to jump through to, to run a business as well as see patients. Now, I will tell you, um, when it comes to the FICA, which is the issue, the 15.3%, as compared to the R&D, there's going to be certain states where it makes sense to increase it to get that little delta there. But in most cases, like if you're in Texas, somewhere like that there, if you're only getting a 7 or 8% uh, return on that, it doesn't make sense just to increase it because R&D, you do it to be compliant. That would be the only reason. Yeah, and the flip side too is, is I run across docs who are taking a very, very high oh, yes. W-2 and are unnecessarily paying more in taxes. So that... that is where this reasonable compensation makes a lot of sense to make sure you're in the Goldilocks zone of your W-2. Yeah, exactly. And this just establishes what the least amount you should be taking. So listen, again, thank you all very much for tuning in. We wanted to, to put together a nice video for those who are about to walk through the process. And then we're going to have another one for once you go through this process the first time, how to make sure that you're optimizing it in the future. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Jim. Appreciate everyone uh, joining us today. We look forward to talking to you again in the future.